everyone and welcome to this talk about AI tools and architecture. In this talk, I'm creating a map of some of the tools out there, grouping the tools by the technologies to create them and showing how they work and what you can use them for. So, right, this is the master diagram of the most popular AI tools used by architecture professionals. Green boxes on the right hand side are machine learning tools, also called generative AI, like ChatGPT and Midjourney. Uh, blue boxes on the left are classical AI tools or traditional AI tools like TestFit and Grasshopper. Uh, this diagram is also on the web essay version of this presentation which you'll see at the end. So the key distinction here is that there are two types of AI being created. These are machine learning from examples and classical AI or traditional AI uh, created by writing instructions in computer code. Um, in this presentation, green slides will be machine learning tools and blue slides this will be classical AI tools. Um, <clears throat> the technology used to create classical AI is writing instructions in computer code or visual programming um, that are then executed by the computer, whereas machine learning is created using by training a neural network on examples and then it can create new examples of the things it was trained upon. Right, so that is the kind of key distinction in this talk, that there's two distinct types of technology being used to create two different types of AI tool. So as I said, green slides are machine learning tools, and here are the main types of machine learning tools out there. Um, are also called generative AI tools. They are grouped by what type of output they generate. These include tools like ChatGPT that create text and computer code. They also include Midjourney that outputs images. The main types of generative AI mach machine learning tools are text generators, code generators, image generators, 3D model generators, video generators, and finally action generators. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so for each type of machine learning generative AI tool, I'm going to show you how they generate the output and what they can be used for in a professional setting. So firstly, text. So Text generators like ChatGPT um, can be used, to, uh, uh, but there are others like Google Gemini and Claude. If you train one of these machine learning tools on a thousand articles about Loki, it can create a new article about the TV series Loki. This will be in some way an average version of all the articles it was trained on. So if 90% of the article is mentioned is hat, then the article that the AI generates will also likely mention is hat. Um, chat GPT has been trained on millions of lines of text and can create new text on almost anything. The key point with machine learning generative AI tools is they are able to create examples of things they were trained on. So if it was trained on lots of text, it can create new text. So here is part of the master diagram. It's machine learning from examples. It's a text generator. And the key ones are kind of ChatGPT, Google, Gemini, Bing, Claude, and there are plenty of others. So in this video, I will show Google Gemini creating a BIM execution plan. Then it exports this to Google Docs with formatting. Um, beware of using these tools for such a task 
They make mistakes and make stuff up. They need checking by a professional afterwards. Uh, I'm not suggesting you use them for this sort of task completely, but they can help speed up the creation of documents as long as you thoroughly check and improve them afterwards. So in this video, I've gone to Google Gemini. I've asked it what sort of document I want it to create. I've put in some specifics about it being the UK and on Rivet, and it's created a BIM execution plan. You can then export it to Google Docs and improve it and check it and correct it on there. So, so what can text generators help with? They can help you draft documents. You can ask them questions about the planning and building regulations. They can summarize longer text for you. Um, they are more conversational than doing a Google search, so you can ask them questions back and forth so you understand the topic more clearly. Um, but beware, they are guessing, not thinking. So they make stuff up and what they call hallucinate. Um, they have been trained on enormous amounts of text, so they appear to have a very large uh, general knowledge. Um, but they don't really have a mind. They just they don't understand what the text means that they are generating. They've just been trained on a lot of text so they can generate appropriate text uh, for your prompt. <clears throat> right, so that was text generators. Now we're going to look at code generators. Uh, Chat GPT can also create text based computer code in languages like Python and C Sharp. They have been trained on millions of lines of computer code collected over the years, and then they can generate new computer code when prompted. And um, they make stuff up like fake API calls, and sometimes the code they generate will not run in, in the software you want it to do. You can Use it to generate computer code to automate tasks in Revit. Um, so here is the master that I'm going. It's a machine learning tool. It's a code generator, and the key ones are ChatGPT, Gemini, GitHub, Copilot, CodePal.ai. But really, there are lots and lots out there doing this code generating sort of job. So in this video, I used ChatGPT to write a Rhino 3D Python script. So Rhino 3D is the 3D modeling software and Python is the computer coding language. And I asked it to create a script to generate a hemispherical dome. And um, I had to manually check the script it created and it did create some unwanted features in the dome. Um, they're kind of most useful to people that can already write a bit of code. Um, so if I sh just show the video. Um, so the first step is inside chat GPT, write a prompt, tell it what, you want, what I want it to write. I want to write a Python script for Rhino 3D Modeler, and that script should generate a simple hemispherical Dumb. So it's going to go ahead and write a Python script for you and you can watch it as it writes it out. Then you go simply back up to the top. And copy the code. Then you open up your Rhino and. You open up the Python editor inside Rhino. Copy and paste the code in. Then click run, which is a little green arrow. It's going to ask for some prompts sometimes. So where are you going to place the geometry? And then you'll notice the code mainly runs and creates a hemispherical dome. But you'll notice in the inside of the dome, it's got some surfaces that we didn't really want. Um, that's because this tool, ChatGPT, is just having a guess at what the correct code is. And sometimes it guesses wrong. So it's ended up creating a dome with extra bits inside. Um, so as you'll see on the next slide, so what can these uh, code generators be used for? 
They can create code in many different text-based coding languages. They are most useful for people that already code and can debug and improve the code that they write. Um, they do create fake code that doesn't run, like fake API calls. Um, they are guessing, not thinking like a human programmer. Um, so they can be somewhat useful, but they do make mistakes and they're not going to do the whole job for you. Right, so next we're going to look at generative AI images <clears throat> or image generators. Uh, these generative AI machine learning tools that create images. If you train a, a neural network on a million pictures of cats, it can create a new picture of a cat, basically. Um, so this is the master diagram. You'll notice there's machine learning from examples, image generators, and then there's three different types, which I'll talk about next. But the main tools here are kind of like Midjourney, DALI, Comfy UI, Vizoid, Stable Diffusion, but there's many, many more, and some of them are free to use, some of them cost money. So <clears throat> what are the main types of image generators out there? There's image from a text prompt. So I wrote a prompt saying, design me a futuristic, peer, uh, futuristic pavilion at the end of a pier over a lake, and it can create something really cool looking. The main tools in this space are kind of DALI from OpenAI and Midjourney. Uh, this next set in the middle, I think, is kind of more useful for architecture professionals. Um, so it's image from image input slash control geometry. So if you have a really simple blocky model of your design and you want a realistic render really quickly, you can use the control geometry of your simple blocky model to create realistic renders to the same shape as your building. Uh, the main tools in this space are kind of like Evolve Lab, Veras, Vizoid, and Stable Diffusion. The final type of image generators are kind of more image modifiers. So you can draw a shape around an area of a picture and ask it to put a leopard in there. And the kind of the main tool in that space is Adobe Firefly with its generated fill. Um, capabilities. Right, so next. Um, in this video, I use DALI from OpenAI to create a design inspiration image for a countryside cabin. I wrote a text prompt and it created many different image options. And then I used one to build a simple Rhino 3D model. Right, so in this video, I've gone to chat GPT, I've created a text prompt and it's going to create me an image and then lots of other images when I rewrite that prompt in the box. So I use this final image here, which looks at like half the building is split down the middle as like inspiration to create a simple Rhino 3D model. I'm going to use this simple Rhino 3D model to demonstrate other image generated machine learning tools. So this was the design inspiration and this is the 3D model I manually modeled based on it. So again, this is the this is in a way showing how you can use image generated by image tools to inspire you to create a, a more detailed model or a simple model. <clears throat> Right. Um, right. So once you have a blocky concept model like that model you just saw, you can use AI tools to now very, very quickly create realistic renders of that design concept. The tool I'm using in this video is called Vizoid, but there are others like Evolve Lab Veras. This is an example of an image generated tool creating a new image from control geometry. Because it uses the blocky concept model image to guide the photorealistic output, you can create a control image it's going to look like. Um, I would recommend that you don't use these for planning drawings because they can create unwanted features. 
that you didn't intend to be there, like a door in a wall where there isn't a door in your model. Um, they look better than traditional renders, but can include features that are not in the model. Whereas a traditional render software like Lumion would never create unmodeled features. I would say they are best for early stage design development. So if we watch this video, I'm going to demonstrate the Vizoid AI image generator tool. First thing you need to do is upload the control, control geometry image, which is a simple picture of the blocking model. And then you add your text prompt of how you want the final image to look. Generate it. And it's going to create photorealistic renders. Based on. Your blocky concept model. They do take a little while to generate. So you notice this one has doors where it shouldn't have doors. This one's a bit better. There are no doors there. Um, but some of the stuff is not quite accurate. Um, so this is different to how a traditional render rendering software works, but its outputs are kind of very cool looking and look very realistic and you can get there a lot quickly, a lot more quickly than doing a traditional rendering method. Uh, one thing it's important to know is the output of AI image generators are flat images. Even if they look 3D, they are not a 3D model, just a flat image. So the model on the right is the old um, Rivet sample model, and that is a 3D BIM model. And even though this image on the left looks very detailed and looks realistic, it is not a 3D model. The image isn't being generated from a 3D view of a model. It's a flat image um, and not the same thing. So when you first start using these tools, they look like amazing designers. So I've asked it to create a Norman Foster tower and it's done an amazing job. But are they really? Sometimes they create features that are not driven by an underlying space creating logic. They are just guessing and sometimes that results in something useful and sometimes not. So for example, in this image, you've got these wavy bits on the side. Now, could they be creating corner office pods or are they some sort of wind deflector thing or something? So it looks very cool, but is it really the right solution for that tower design in that location? Um, and they're not really being driven by an, an underlying space creating logic in the way that you try and do when you're trying to think of shapes in your head. Um, so they look cool, but are they really um, that great? I think they're best for just inspiration, really. Um, they have other limitations too. So if you ask it to create an architectural floor plan of an apartment, it might look amazing, but you'll see the bedroom here on the bottom right corner doesn't have a door to it. So you can actually get in that room. Next thing, maybe if you want some help doing a wall to roof detail drawing and you ask it to create one for you, it's going to create something like this, which looks amazing, but it's not going to solve your detailing problem. Then as well, you might want to think about how you passively light and cool your building. So you could ask it to create a ventilation diagram. It's going to create something amazing looking, but it's not going to solve your ventilation um, problem in your building. So, <clears throat> so what are they good for? I think they are good for design inspiration. They are not so good for solving architectural problems like detailing and passive ventilation strategies, um, but they are very cool um, tools that can create some really amazing images, um, but they don't solve all your problems. <laughs> so the next type of machine learning tool we're going to look at are 3D model generators. These are a subgroup of generative AI tools that create 3D outputs. 
In general, they require an image or a video input. They output a 3D mesh of the approximate shape of the object in the image or video. Um, if you want to create a 3D model from an image generated by Midjourney, this is probably still best done manually. But so this is the master diagram. It's a machine learning from examples. It's a 3D model generator. And here are some of the common ones out there, but there are lots. Uh, Mesh AI and so on. Um, so someone's created a picture here on probably Midjourney and they've cut out the bit they want to create a 3D model of. And then they've inputted it into one of these tools and it's generated a sort of mesh, sort of surface mesh of that shape. But you'll notice at the very bottom, it's all a bit messy. And um, so it's helpful if you're trying to model that, but it's not done the full job. Um, if we look at the next slide, I've got a video showing how one of the AI images I generated of the timber cabin, I put into this meshy.ai 3D model generator, and I've asked it to create a 3D model of that timber clad cabin. Um, so if we watch the video, you'll see it's got some limitations. So there's the image. I want to create a 3D model of that cabin. I first have to name the project and then upload the image. So that's the image I want to create a 3D model from. And then you click generate and it takes a few moments to generate the 3D model. And then if we look at the 3D model that is created, it's not really that useful in an architectural setting. It's got the rough shape of the building, but it's very, very messy. Um, it's not really designed to do that sort of task. Um, but I think it's it's got abilities in the computer games industry to create assets. And I think that's where it's mainly being used. They're not going to be able to, from an image, generate a BIM model of the same shape as that building in the picture. Um, so that was 3D model generators. Now we're going to look at videos. So video generators, as I have said before, machine learning tools create new examples of things they have been trained on. If you show them a million videos of a person walking down the street, they can create a new video of someone walking down the street. So they've been trained on many examples of one thing, then they can create a new example of that thing. Um, <clears throat> you can create videos from a text prompt or you can create them by inputting an image and asking them to animate parts of the image or animate walking through the image. So as you see, it's a uh, machine learning from examples is video generator. Here are some of the common ones out there. Runway, Sorrowed by OpenAI, Nvidia.io. Um, but really, there's there's lots of them out there. So one way they might be useful to architects and architectural professionals is in creating a more interesting view of a design. Uh, in this video, I use the AI tool Runway to turn a still image into a short video. But as you will see at the end of the video, the more movement you create, the more errors the video will have. So if we watch the video, the first image doesn't move very much and the cabin stays correct. But the more movement you do with the camera, you'll see the cabin starts to change shape and become different. So what can AI image uh, video generators be used for? Um, I don't think they're particularly useful for architectural professionals. They cannot replace doing a fly through animation for a rivet model. So if your project's quite far down the line and you've got a rivet model and you want to fly through the main spaces, these video generators, these AI video generators cannot replace the same task. Um, 
they're not going to uh, improve on that. But you could take the the fly through animation from Rivet and improve it in an AI image generator, an AI video generator. Uh, but they're not going to replace doing a fly through because they're doing a different thing. Um, what I think they might be useful for is in making interesting presentation content for early stage design reviews. So if you have a bit of the building that moves, you could animate it in the video generator AI and it'll create more interesting content for for an early stage design review. So we've looked at generative AI videos, images, and then finally, we're going to look at actions. The final type of machine learning tool I will look at is large action models. Whenever you interact with your computer, your phone or a piece of software, your interactions are recorded and used to train large action models. Um, these can be useful to architectural professionals because they can automate tasks in very powerful ways. I will look at two tools in this group, Swap and Evolve Lab Glyph. Um, so it's a type of machine learning from examples, but it's generating actions. So it's being trained on actions to be able to generate actions. Um, <clears throat> so in this video, the generative AI tool called Swap creates a full set of construction stage drawings and a 3D model from a diagram layout of a building. It is very impressive how much output it creates from such a small input. You create the diagram, floor levels and grids in the Rivet model, then upload it to the SWAP website and it will generate the entire set of construction drawings and a 3D BIM model. So if we watch this video, this is really quite an impressive tool. Um, I'm not 100% sure how it works, but it is a type of machine learning model and a, a large action model type. So you've got your grids and your floor levels and a diagram of each floor plan. You upload that Rivet model to their website. It's generating plans, elevation, sections, and details, schedules, MEP stuff, 3D model. So this 3D model that they've created here was matching the diagram, the 2D diagram they did in Rivet. Then it's generated a full set of construction drawings. As far as I'm aware, this company trains its models on your company's past projects. So if your company has a set way of doing drawings, a set way of numbering drawings and how they should be laid out, this model will follow your company standards and generate the the um, <clears throat> the drawings according to them. Right, uh, the next type of large action model we're going to look at is Evolve Lab Glyph. And what this uh, tool tries to do is help speed up doing construction stage drawings. So a lot of people have done similar tasks. Uh, setting up drawings for the construction stage in Revit, and they've used that to train this model to help complete those common things. Um, I'm, I've not had a chance to use it or explore it more, but it looks like a very powerful tool that can really help speed up a lot of common drawing tasks. Um, there were a lot of things this can do that were very hard to automate using traditional AI or classical AI, which is where you're writing a computer code to, to automate certain tasks. So these new machine learning generative AI tools can do stuff that <coughs> classical AI couldn't. Um, so what can action generators do? Large action models work like predictive text in emails, but they don't guess the next word. They guess your next action. I think these sort of large action models are going to be used to create co-pilots. So when you're working in, in BIM or Revit, 
you're going to have a AI co-pilot working alongside you that is going to help speed up common tasks you're doing uh, and kind of assist you to make the right choices in it. Um, so, <clears throat> so now we have looked at the common types of machine learning generative AI tools, but what are their limitations? Well, can you train them on a million hospital BIM models and generate a new hospital BIM model for your project? Yes, but because they are guessing, they will probably not likely produce something that matches your site and brief. Um, so, um, yeah, architectural design is very finicky, and so guessing will not generate the correct or unlikely to generate the correct solution. But as we're going to see in the next session, next section about uh, classical AI or traditional AI, there are other types of tools being created in the AI field, which uh, are not using machine learning, but are still able to do really impressive things uh, and maybe generate more buildable sort of outputs. Um, <clears throat> So in this section, we will now look at classical AI tools. Classical AI are tools that create their output by following instructions written down in computer code. There are three main types of tools in this group. One is visual programming, like Grasshopper and Dynamo BIM, text-based coding, like Python and C Sharp. And then the final group is custom software, like test fit and architectures. So the first type of classical AI I want to look at is called visual programming. And it's on this branch, classical AI using coding, visual programming. The main tools out there are kind of Grasshopper, Dynamo BIM, Paramo, generative components in Bentley software, Marionette in Vectorworks, and geometry nodes in Blender BIM. Now, what is visual programming? Well, you uh, create a flow diagram that generates geometry or automates the task. So you create, you add little boxes to this flow diagram, you wire them together, and that creates the instructions for the computer to follow to either create geometry or to automate a task inside Rivet or inside Rhino. <clears throat> So I'll show you a video of visual programming. So in this video, you're going to see the grasshopper visual programming language being used to design a tall tower with a honeycomb cladding pattern. And um, I think these tools are, are easy to use for architectural professionals because they're very visual in nature. So if you watch this video, it's type of classical AI, it's visual programming. And you'll see on the left is the 3D model inside Rhino. On the right is the smaller window is the Grasshopper visual programming language. And as I change parameters in the script, the geometry on the left changes shape and height. So <clears throat> although it's not as cool looking as something that Mid Journey produces, it's a more buildable um, output because it's a coordinated 3D model that you can generate drawings of. So what can visual programming be used to create? They can be used to doing, for doing micro automation and creating complex geometry. So micro automation might be something like produce, mass producing room data sheets with schedules and views. And creating complex geometry might be this little island project in New York, where each one of these little bases is a different size and height. Uh, so that's really complicated geometry and most likely completed using Rhino Grasshopper. Um, and this might be Dynamo BIM inside Revit. So <clears throat> I think they are better for creating complex geometry because of the visual feedback. When you add a new box to the flow diagram, you can see what it does instantly in the 3D view. 
they can help overcome project bottlenecks that slow projects down. So, for example, if you were working on a, a tower project that had like a very complex facade pattern, now if that um, facade pattern was generated manually and then the building was to change height, that remodeling of the facade pattern would be a project bottleneck that slowed things down. But if you generated that complex facade pattern using visual programming like Grasshopper, you change a parameter in the script and it will readjust to the new height of the building and that will no longer be a project bottleneck. That will be something that can be incorporated into the floor. Um, so they are a useful way of overcoming these sort of problems in projects. <clears throat> um, the next type of classical or traditional AI are text-based coding. So by text-based coding, I mean, instead of creating a flow diagram, you write words and numbers in text. And the main types of text programming languages used by architectural professionals are C Sharp, Python, MouseScript, RhinoScript, VB.net, but there are many others. Um, they have been used by architects and architectural technologists for many years. Um, <clears throat> um, they can be used to create software such as Rivet, but they can also be used inside Rivet to automate tasks using plugins like PyRivet. <clears throat> so in this video, I use a Python script to generate a text note of the area of each glass panel on this uh, pier. And then I use I used ChatGPT to create this Python script. Um, this is an example of how you can use text-based coding to do micro automation on real projects. So it's classical AI, it's a coding example. I've got here a 3D model of a pier. I want to know the area of each one of those glass balustrade panels. I've got the Python script from ChatGPT. I've run the Python script inside uh, Rhino and it's automatically created a text note of the area of each glass panel. So it's doing micro automation. Um, so like visual programming, they can be used for micro automation and creating complex geometry, but I think they are best at micro automation, whereas visual programming is better for creating complex geometry because you get that instant visual feedback. Um, so as you see, it's flipped. It's got limited ability to create complex geometry because you really don't get that instant checking ability. Um, but it is very good at doing micro automation, so it's better for that sort of stuff. <clears throat> right, uh, the final type of traditional or classical AI tool out there are things like custom softwares. Now, these have either been created using visual programming or in most cases they've been created using text-based coding, but I'm including them as a separate group here um, because the kind of there are products you can use off the shelf um, there's quite a lot of tools out there custom software for the architecture industry um, but the main ones are kind of like listed here in the master diagram like test fit finch 3d sites all by ramble make it ai spacio Hectare Architectures, and there's a website called Hyper, which we'll discuss later. So they are very powerful tools and can create realistic building proposals. Um, so this image is test fit, and that's the edge of the site there, and it's automatically generated these buildings on top of that site. So if we go to this video, this video is showing the sort of general method by which these custom softwares create their output. So basically you have you have to locate your site on a map, then you draw the site boundary within the software, 
and you ask it to generate a certain type of building on that site. So if we watch this video, that's going to show the generic way these custom softwares work. So you've located your site on the map, you draw the outline of your site, <clears throat> then you click generate and it pops up and shows you what type of buildings you could fit on your site and it'll give you a readout of like the floor area that can be generated on that site. This is a very generic example that I created myself, but I have got a video at the end showing what test fit and architectures do, which is much more impressive. <clears throat> so what are custom software is good for? I think they're good for early stage massing studies and site optioneering. Although it's worth mentioning that test fit, the US company, have had real buildings built from its software's output. Um, they can be created by using text-based coding. They can also be created from visual programming methods. Um, there are websites like Hyper and ShapeDiver that give access to mini custom softwares that do similar things to test fit. Um, so that was kind of the end of classical AI and machine learning. Now I'm going to sort of move on to the conclusion stage of the presentation. Um, so now we have seen examples of both machine learning tools and classical AI tools. It is my suggestion that these two different types of technology are similar to two different types of human mental processes we use when designing. So machine learning from examples when it generates an output, it's kind of like the human mental process of guessing because it's not really thinking and trying to figure stuff out. It's you've asked it for something and it's going to have an instant guess of what that thing is. Um, whereas classical AI or traditional AI is more like sitting down with a ruler and a pen and working things out. So you're sitting there trying to figure out how you can fit those rooms on that site area and um, so generative AI is kind of like guessing classical AI is more like working things out this is the master diagram again so uh, on the right are the machine learning tools and on the left are the classical AI tools but you'll see how there's like crossover between the two so you can use code generators to help you do visual programming and then the output of your visual programming script you can feed into an image generator tool and create realistic renders of it or if you've generated a um, an image from an image generator tool you can then feed it into a video generator or feed it into a 3d model generator so there's a lot of crossover between the two types of tools. Um, right, so now I want to talk a little bit about self-driving cars. I'm going to come back to this at the end as well. Um, but I think they relate to how the computer is increasingly used to help design buildings. Right, the main point to make here is that at the moment, cars are driven by individual people and when they are involved in crashes, only the people involved in that crash learn from the mistake. But when a car is driven by a computer, if a crash happens, the code is updated and all self-driving cars in the system learn from the mistake. Um, so at the moment, like buildings are generally designed by individual people and <clears throat> the only the kind of result of that individual person's um, knowledge that they've gained over the years. But once computers start to be more and more designed, I mean, once architecture starts to be more and more designed by computers and code is shared between people, then there is going to be sort of system wide gains in the same way that a network of self-driving cars would learn from each other. Um, that I think is the point I want to make here. Um, so next conclusions. 
Uh, currently, most tools are created using one or other type of technology. So they're either machine learning from examples or their traditional AI. But I think what's coming down the line is a blended tool that uses both machine learning and traditional AI um, to create its features. Um, <clears throat> Machine learning tools have limitations um, they can be great for inspiration, but they can't really solve detailing problems or do passive environmental design. Um, another point here is about how architecture is marketed. So for a long time now, we've used a really cool rendering of the project to help sell the project to the client or to help sell it to the end users. And these generative AI image generators can create really cool looking pictures much more quickly and easily. Um, so I think that model of marketing architecture based on cool marketing images is facing competition from tools like Midjourney that can create even cooler pictures even quicker. Um, so my main prediction for what's coming down the line is co-pilots. When you're working in software, you're going to have a digital AI co-pilot that is helping you complete tasks. Um, and then the final point, I think the more a computer is used to help generate the design, the more opportunity there is for sort of system-wide gains um so once you start sharing the code that generates the design then that's going to lead to a general improvement in the standard of the design um this tool here uh created by an american company designed together is an example of a blended tool so it uses traditional ai to create some of its features and machine learning to add in extra bits and um, so I'm going to show a video of this tool so there you've got basically a digital co-pilot so that's what they're trying to create with this tool so when you're working on a detail in Revit this tool is going to help guide you to the correct layout that you should be aiming for I've got a video here <clears throat> So you start off with your Revit model, create a call out, then you open up the design together co-pilot. You have to set a few parameters, choose a few options. Uh, and then as you work through the process, you'll see it generates what that detail should look like. You can then import that into Revit, edit it a bit, if you want to change it around. <clears throat> so that was an example of a blended tool that uses both machine learning and traditional AI to create a digital co-pilot to work alongside you when you're creating construction drawings in Revit. What are the main takeaways from this presentation? These are, there are two types of technology being used to create AI tools. These are machine learning from examples, creates new examples of the things it was trained on. Um, classical AI is created by writing instructions in computer code for the computer to execute. They tend to produce different types of outputs. Classical AI creates more buildable outputs, but machine learning creates more futuristic, cool looking sort of outputs. Um, and then the more you use code to help uh, create the design, the, the more you'll get system-wide improvements because of sharing of code. So I've got a few videos to finish off with, but what, what are kind of some of my recommendations? Well, I think you could be using Midjourney to help uh, in early design stage inspiration, get some inspiration from Midjourney. You could use Vizoid and Veras um, to turn 
early blocky concept models into realistic renders. You could use Dynamo, BIM or Grasshopper 3D to create complex geometry and do micro automation. You could use ChatGPT to help draft documents. You can also use ChatGPT to write Python scripts to automate tasks in Revit, but they do need debugging. Um, you could be using proprietary software like TestFit to help do massing studies early on for sites. Uh, and then <clears throat> finally, probably explore the use of large action models like Swap and Evolve Lab Glyph um, to help speed up doing construction stage drawings. So those are kind of my, my main sort of recommendations for how to use some of these tools that are out there. I would say at the moment, the kind of like the market out there of these tools is very messy and um, it's kind of like you've got to wade through it all to find the ones that suit what you want to do. There's so many different tools out there um, and they're all slightly different, but <clears throat> hopefully this presentation has sort of mapped it out a little bit for you. Um, I'd like to just finish with a few videos, then we'll do questions. So here is a, an example of an image generator tool being used to create like an alien looking world using image from control geometry. A video generator is then used to animate and add more interest. So <clears throat> created a simple-ish sort of Rhino 3D model that looks a bit alien -y. And then you create a 2D image of that. Then again, you can drop this image into an AI image generator like Vizoid and it'll create a realistic alien world from it. Then they can use Runway to animate bits of the image. Um, this next example um, is demonstrating how hand sketches can still be quite useful in, in today's market. And <clears throat> so you can input an image to Vizoid, a hand sketch, and then type a text prompt of what you want the final image to look like. And then <clears throat> you have to wait a few moments for it to generate it. And it's gonna take your hand sketch and then output realistic photo realistic renders of the building in the right setting that you wanted um, so it's really impressive it's going to change some bits of the sketch into something you didn't really want but it's going to do mainly a good job uh, this next video i've asked chat gpt dali to create a design of a Richard Rogers house in the desert. Uh, and then I asked it to do some architectural drawings of that house. Um, I did this to demonstrate how the first image it creates and then the latter images it creates, there's no connection between the two. Um, so in the way of Rivet, when it generates a floor plan or a section, it's being driven by a 3D model in the background. This DALI system is not working the same. So if I show you the video. Um, so I'm in ChatGPT. And I'm writing the text prompt. Right, so it's created a house in the desert that looks a bit Richard Rogers style building. Then I'm asking it to create an architectural plan drawing of that house. And it takes a few seconds for it to generate an image. But <clears throat> ah. 
as you will see, the plan drawing it creates is of a different house. So it's not relating it back to the first image. I gave it one more try to get uh, a correct drawing from that first image by creating a call out drawing. And again, it has a go at creating an image. But the image again is unrelated to the first one. Each time it's generating a brand new image and it can't remember what the first image will look like. So. Now uh, go back to traditional or classical AI and here is a couple of video examples. Firstly of a tool called architectures and then the second part is of test fit. Now one thing to point out here, it looks very cool what they're doing, but it's not machine learning. This is all being hard coded in text based computer coding. And so it's very difficult and time consuming to create these tools that can do these things. So. <clears throat> um, so this first one is architectures and it creates apartment drawings and layouts and buildings. Uh, at different orientations on a site. Uh, all that behavior of that system has had to be hard coded in text based coding language and this is test fit i'm sure a lot of you have probably already seen test fit it's been around a few years it can do amazing things it looks really cool it can output all sorts of data about it's um the model it produces um they have had real buildings built based on their output of their tool um, so finally there is a <clears throat> um, example of a visual programming script so <clears throat> i've created a visual programming script in grasshopper to generate a covered walkway so on the right is the grasshopper script now you'll see how when you alter the shape of the input curve the shape of the walkway also changes so that if during the design stage the shape of the walkway changes you don't have to manually remodel the whole walkway you can just use the grasshopper script to change the shape of the walkway um, so that's another example of visual programming and how it can be used to create architectural objects and finally um we've got a another example of a visual programming script one that utilizes a genetic algorithm solver to maximize the size of a car park on a development site by changing where the building should be located so in this video, um, when it loads, you see we've got various different site layouts. The red box is the building and as you change where the building is located on the site, the green polygon, the car park changes size. So what this genetic algorithm solver is trying to do is trying to get the maximum size of car park by moving around the building on the site so as you see as time goes on it, it roughly finds the best place to put the building so that you get the maximum size of car park on that site shape um, so that's a genetic algorithm solver um, inside a visual programming classical ai tool right um, before we get to the questions um, i've got a couple of key questions to go through first which i think probably will have been asked by this point so one key question is how do i think ai will affect jobs well <clears throat> the thing about kind of how technology um changes jobs is technology generally 
generally increases productivity of individual workers, meaning that one worker complete can complete the task of multiple workers using older technology, which is obviously a negative impact on jobs. Um, but it seems like this is always counteracted by a general increase in demand. And this is why uh, governments always want constant economic growth to um, downplay uh, um, to affect these issues. Right. Another thing that I think it's worth talking about is how AI has impacted a different industry of um, uh, professional translating from different languages. So <clears throat> basically, uh, Google Translate now uses machine learning to help translate text from different languages into, let's say, English. So if a company has a document in a foreign language that they want translated into English, they can now do it for free for themselves on Google Translate. But the issue is these systems do make mistakes. And if you're not familiar with the foreign language, you will never ever spot those mistakes that it makes. So you could be working on incorrect information. So that is kind of one point why professional translators are still a valuable kind of addition to just doing it yourself for free on Google Translate. Another key point is like a professional translator can <clears throat> summarize and make commentary on the kind of document itself. So in a way that Google Translate can, a professional translator could say, in my assessment, this contract that I've translated is of a common type and it's not very tricky to deal with and they've just stuck to the industry standard. So Google Translate can't do that. So what Google Translate, I think, is mainly being used for in the translation industry is to help professional translators speed up the completion of their task. But they always need to be double checked at the end and improved upon by the professional translator. So I think in a similar way, these new AI tools in architecture are going to be used as co-pilots to assist architectural professionals rather than simply swapping them out and and then finally uh self-driving cars <clears throat> um so designing a, a really complex hospital is probably a more difficult challenge than driving a car but in general the ai technology people still haven't solved self-driving cars now on the market tesla is probably the only one with a commercial self-driving feature, but there's no taxi company on earth that has replaced all their drivers with Teslas because they're simply not at that level yet. So the good news for us in the architecture sector is designing a hospital is a more complex challenge uh, than driving a car and driving a car still haven't been completely taken over by computers. <laughs> so the next a key question I think I might get asked is like what sort of advice do you give to people starting out in the career well I used to say learn grasshopper and dynamo but now I think actually those are not kind of key what's what's more important is learning the key skills in, of an architectural technologist which is building regs knowledge and detailing yes there are detailing co-pilots coming down the line like design together but you still need to have a thorough understanding of detailing so that you can add design flair and cope with unusual detailing situations um in terms of rhino grasshopper and and dynamo bim i think these are great tools to learn and they can be used to create complex geometry and do micro automation but basically Basically, what I think architecture professionals need to become is more like conductors in orchestras. Um, so they don't need to play the violin or the piano really well. But and, and by that, I mean, they don't need to write the scripts that they're going to be using, but they need to know when those parts of the. 
um, project can be done by a computer script. So like the conductor knows when the violin should be played. And if you're orchestrating the project in that way, you're getting the work done more efficiently um, and, and so on. Uh, as I said, as was said at the start of the presentation, this slide, all these slides are going to be shared uh, with you later online. And there is also a web essay version of this presentation with the videos on my website. Um, so that's kind of the end of the presentation now. And I can show you, if you like, uh, a couple of uh, tools, one machine learning tool and one uh, traditional AI tool, uh, and then we'll open for questions. So I'm just going to close that now. So firstly, here on the right is the Grasshopper Visual Programming Language. Each one of these little boxes performs an action and is the output is wired to the input of the next box. And this script here is generating this geometry on the right, which is more buildable than the output of, of mid journey. And to demonstrate how you could use it to overcome a project bottleneck of changing height of a building, I'm just going to drag it down. All right. It is a bit slow sometimes. Right, anyway. So I altered a parameter in the script and it's changed the geometry in the 3D view instantly. And so that is Rhino and this is Grasshopper Visual Programming Language. The next tool I just want to show quickly is another visual programming language, but this time being used to create um, AI images in, in stable diffusion. So we've got here the positive prompt, a red panda drinking a beer. And if I click Q prompt, we're going to see the image pop up here soon. So this tool is called Comfy UI and it is a AI image generator that you can download for free and generate images for free running on your own laptop. And it's also a visual programming language. And I think back up. Right. Uh, well, thank you for listening, and now we've got time for any questions. Thank you, Simon. Uh, that was brilliant. There wasn't a lot of questions, but they are starting to um, filter through now. I think it was great okay. presentation. Mm -hmm. Just kind of go through everything. When I say there wasn't a lot of questions on there, I've got quite a few um, here. But I'll um, go through the ones on the chat, and then we'll pick up these ones, and um, we'll wrap it up on the end. So okay. Chris Lane has ha asked a really um, very on point good question, which basically says when mm -hmm. using the AI image generators, where does copyright and intellectual property fall? Do you need to credit the mm -hmm. AI software? Mm -hmm. Right. Have we got okay. to that stage yet? Or <laughs> is, is there any kind yeah. of case law on that? Or? Right. I know. Uh... It's different for each one, really, because Stable Diffusion, they have a, a license. So that, that final bit of software that I showed you, which was called Comfy UI, that uses Stable Diffusion. And they have a license that says any image you generate, you own. So if you're the one writing the text prompt and inputting the control geometry, then the image that you output at the end is your is owned by you. Is that so, copyrighted in, does it have kind of like a trademark or anything kind of in the um, image to say that it belongs to you or? No, I don't think it's sort of copyrighted to you. I mean, I'm 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 not 100% sure on these things, but it's kind of like 
right there's kind of two parts to that question one is like the image it generates do you own it and which is a bit of a gray area and and different for each tool so vizoid you could probably read their terms of conditions and it might tell you if you own it or they own it um but in terms of it was trained on other people's images mm. right so that is more difficult um and i think that's does your image quite... then kind of fill into that big soup of images so would the machine learning given that it learns from images does your image then go into that kind of cat that yeah. catalog they're trying to avoid that really okay yeah because if if it's just like learning from its own images then it's going to increasingly make more and more mistakes so they they've tried to train it on actual human generated images whether that's photographs or renders and and they have less mistakes in them but ai image generators generated images tend to have loads of mistakes in them so they can't use those images for training data um so, the, so do they control that kind of training yeah so library, really? because all these tools have took years to develop and they take a long while to do the training phase. They were kind of all trained on data that existed before these tools arrived. Okay. In a way. So in the so previous the years. We're still learning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm not really sure if you own the images that you generate, but um I, I guess it'd be different for each one anyway. Because I'm sure we'll um, yeah. find out when case law kind of comes across yeah, and yeah. someone uses someone's um, image yeah. and it, it gets written. So I think it's probably a proceed with caution. I mean, um, there was there's a new company in London called Studio Tim Fu, and they do a lot of research into AI. Now, he made the point that then, like, when you look at a building, as you're walking down the street and you like a certain part of the building and you think, oh, I might use something similar to that on one of my projects. Well, you're doing the same thing as what these AI tools have done. They're looking at examples and creating new examples. So you've been inspired by part of the building, but these software tools, these AI tools have been inspired by images of lots of buildings. But we're basically doing the same thing and you can't, his opinion was, um, Tim Fu, was that you can't stop that from happening. And if you stop that from happening, do you also have to stop humans from doing it? <laughs> yeah, I so guess it's experience, can't... isn't it? It's like yeah. what you can with your experience as well. You build kind of your own knowledge base and almost sometimes you don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel or learn each time. You've automatically got something embedded yeah. in there, what you're working from. Yeah, I mean, we're all kind of borrowing from each other when we have ideas anyway so I don't think you can stop AI tools from from doing it in a more systematic way because it, it just well they've already done it now. <laughs> yeah it'd be quite interesting to know how um, students are kind of getting along with this in terms of obviously yeah. referencing at university yeah. If they write that as their own piece of work and they have to kind of reference back to um, software, that's probably one that we could pick yeah, up with. I, um, I think that is a more tricky problem is like plagiarism in in the, in the education sector. Um, but I don't know how to solve that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we've got another one. Uh, it says, great presentation. Could I use yeah. Evolve Lab Glyph? to automate adding accurate dimension annotations to a Revit floor plan? Would I need to train it on my previous existing floor plans? All right, um, so no, you wouldn't need to do your own training. Um, they've kind of trained it on lots of examples that have been collected by Autodesk probably. Um, but that is kind of what it's designed for, is, is adding dimensions and adding notes and adding kind of like detail to construction drawings. And it was kind of like really difficult to automate those sort of tasks using traditional AI because the the code would be so convoluted in this situation, do that, in that situation, do this and this and this and then. So 
to be able to automate those sort of tasks using traditional AI was always very difficult. But with machine learning, where it's learned from millions of people doing the same thing or setting up a construction drawing in the same way, it's able to aggregate that those efforts into into a really useful tool. I've not been able to test out Evolve Live Glyph because I don't have Rivet, um, but it does look like a very powerful tool that can really help speed up um, construction drawings. And really, I think if, if some people are already using it in the industry, then if you're comparing yourself to them, you, you kind of slow down a little bit compare in comparison. So it's definitely worth like jumping on board these things early and like um, they are going to be more and more part of the everyday job, I think. Uh. Good stuff. Um, so a couple of questions from me then. So obviously okay. we're doing um, coding. Mm -hmm. um, is there, I'm assuming there's some kind of security risk on that? What can people do mm -hmm. to, I suppose, ensure their computers, software, etc., is not getting infected? Is there a, yeah. are we that far developed yet or is that still um, something we need to be careful of? Right, so the tool I just showed you, like Comfy UI, which is your own personal image generator that runs on your laptop or your desktop, I do think that is a bit risky because I, there are sort of add-ins for that where you don't know who's created them and whether they put malicious code in the middle of them. And so, like, there is a bit of risk with some of these tools. But if you're talking about kind of like uh, Grasshopper and Rhino and Dynamo BIM for Revit, um, there's probably very low risk there because um, they're kind of controlled and created by professional companies that want to make money <laughs> but yeah. there are other types of tools which are more what they call open source which are maybe slightly higher risk i guess i think but like a text-based code in like python is probably pretty safe but yeah. if you're starting to load onto your computer loads of modules and stuff then you're increasing the risk, I think. So I think if someone started to play around with a few of these things like we often do and kind of download mm. a few different items, you yeah. just, kind of just want to be mindful of it, it, in, yeah, it definitely in what is, you're working yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, another one, can you use it to explore complex shapes? So I know you can kind of use it to generate um, mm. an image. For example, if you had quite a complex uh, roof shape, which can be quite difficult to model in kind of some software packages, can you um, use that to kind of import into your model and kind of extract from that or yeah um, is it still a challenging so you can create really complex shapes using rhino grasshopper and if you are mainly working in revit there is now a tool called rhino inside revit which allows this tool to work inside your revit model and create geometry directly inside your rivet model. And as long as you're creating the geometry sensibly, you're gonna create buildable sort of outputs more than what mid journey would do, which creates like crazy shapes and stuff. But sorry, I, I didn't catch the end of the question. <laughs> I was bit it just really to explore complex <laughs> shapes. So for example, if you were kind of just sketching out a roof and you had an idea in your yeah. head could you use kind of AI to generate that shape and you kind of you like the shape of it and then can you then bring it into your Revit model and adapt oh, right. it in yeah. a more complex so uh, if, you, if you've way. got kind of a, a fuzzy idea in your head of like some cool looking roof you could start off by exploring that with DALI or mid journey start generating some text um, uh, start generating some images from some text prompts. So you might have, I want a wavy roof that goes up and down. So you could type that in as a text prompt, generate some early kind of visual inspiration images in mid journey, which will look really cool. But if you then want to get that shape inside your rivet model, then you probably need to turn to Grasshopper and Rhino. So then you start manually recreating that shape, which um, 
as I sort of saw, saw mentioned in the presentation, there are 3D model generators which can generate shapes based on pictures. So say you've had the fuzzy idea of a cool looking roof, you created a, an AI image in mid journey, then you can put that mid journey image inside um, meshy.ai and it will spit out like a mesh model of the roof. Then you can bring that mesh model into Rhino and start rebuilding it in a more rational way. But the main point uh, kind of, of of all this presentation is like, although these tools are doing bits of the job, they're not doing the whole job for you. They kind of give you the starting point and you've kind of got to work using your knowledge and experience, I guess, to kind of develop that model into a buildable. Output, yeah. <laughs> you There's a lot of human effort and creativity still needed to guide and kind of generate the final output from all these tools but the the landscape is very messy there's so many different tools some are doing similar things to each other but in different ways so it's, it's all very complicated and very messy but all, all of it requires like human effort and creativity to sort of guide it into a buildable building um there's not click one button and generate a 3D BIM model. <laughs> there's there's like various <laughs> different bits of this process. So, um, Super. Yeah. And then um, another one in terms of can a computer learn our architectural style? So generally in practice, we all kind of oh, okay. tend to develop yeah. our own little things, what we like and where we are. If we're kind mm -hmm. of using AI, is there potential that we kind of lose that or can it learn what we do? Can we use it to develop kind of our architectural style? What are your thoughts on? Mm, I'm not sure because I, I've i tried typing text prompts into chat GPT and I, I think I had one picture of an a, a tower where I asked it to design a Norman Foster tower and the image it generated didn't really look very Norman Fostery. So, <laughs> so I think like um is is it it sounds like they should have that ability to learn a style but they don't really 100% get there I think. I think mid journey is probably the the best of the best in terms of image generators and if you asked it to design a Frank Gehry building it probably would look quite Frank Gehry building like. He's but, quite striking though isn't he in terms yeah, of his it, forms and yeah his style is very unique isn't it so I mean like I think they've got some ability to do that but but maybe not not 100% there yet so I think I think. Um, um, just a few more questions. We've got a couple okay. of minutes left, so I'll try and mm -hmm. get through these quite quickly. So in terms mm -hmm. of sizes and quality for printing, they obviously look great on computers, but if you're going to print that out kind of in a document, what kind of sizes are you looking at? Uh, is it good print qualities or is that something you can have yeah. control over or not? I think what a lot of people are doing when they create images in mid journey or stable diffusion or even visoid and evolve lab veras is they then use an ai image upscaler to create a more uh, a greater dpi sort of image um so the the initial output probably wouldn't look great printed but you can upscale it in another ai tool to create a more better print version i think but again, then you're probably paying for another subscription to do that because <laughs> a lot of these AI tools, um, they might offer some free features, but are not very useful. Generally, most of these AI machine learning tools want you to subscribe and pay a certain amount each month to use them. Um, so that's something to be considered. But yeah, in general, the output is a bit blurry and then you have to upscale it. Mm. Super. 
Okay, you mentioned some about building regs and planning. Uh, so just looking okay. at building regs and policy, can mm -hmm. you code kind of regs and policy into your design or is that something that's kind of on the horizon coming up? Um, not at the moment. So uh, when, when I mentioned building regs and planning, I was talking about chat GPT. Now chat GPT has been trained on the building regs text and you can ask it questions about the building regulations and its answers are going to be somewhat helpful but it will make mistakes and especially with numbers so if you asked chat gpt can you tell me the current new value requirement for an external cavity wall it'll come up with a number but that number is very unlikely to be correct <laughs> because okay. numbers are very hard to guess correctly because it's just random each time in a way um so that's interesting but it it's kind of a good way to learn more about the regulations because you can ask it in a more conversational way so as long as you're quite um willing to double check what it says with the actual approved documents you can still learn about the building regulations by asking questions such as well chat gpt which building regulation might apply in this situation where i have xyz so if you're asking it in a more conversational way you can learn something about the building regulation but any numbers that it spits out you have to double check them <laughs> it's more um, kind of for reading learning rather than yeah modeling, um, learning so stage. If there's in that classical ai which is like more like working stuff out with a pen and a ruler so like they've got the custom software called test fit now their buildings although this is an american company match building regulations in america so when they generate a building design for your site layout um that's going to be building regs compliant because it's hard coded into how they create their building design okay so it wouldn't be able to create a building that doesn't meet building regs but to create a system like test fit takes many <laughs> many many years of development like they were sat at a computer coding for many many years before they had a product that they could start to sell um so it's, it's not an easy thing to look at the building regs and then turn it into a building generator um we're not at that point we'll, yet. <laughs> we'll have a test model at some point effectively when you've done your design where you can run it through like a script and it can tell you where your different things are which kind of leads on um, to my uh, last question which is okay. your 10-year prediction where do you think we'll be in kind of 10 years right um, <laughs> i'm not yeah. going to hold you to it it's just uh, where kind of from your experience and your knowledge mm. obviously you're quite clued up on ai and very interested in it so it's kind of like where do you think we're going to be right uh so to begin with firstly like i think there will be ai tools that can analyze a project and assess whether it's building regs compliant but i think that's a long-term situation I don't think that that product is going to be released anytime soon. So I think long term, how the thing's going to sort of play out is like in the short to medium term, it's going to continue to be really messy. And like there's going to you're going to be logging on this website to do that task, downloading this plugin to do this task and and using that co-pilot to do that. And it's going to be kind of like all spread out and all messy and kind of like very confusing and you're probably not getting the best use of the current level of technology because each one of these tools is created by a different company and you might not want to subscribe to every single company because that's a lot of money so you might only subscribe to a few so then you're getting only a partial benefit of these new tools so i think in the long term how it it might well how hopefully it might work out is that there'll be websites kind of like high power is doing so high power is an american company where they're trying to collect together all the different algorithms that can be used by architecture and engineering professionals and put them in one place 
So I think what would be most helpful is kind of like once all these different algorithms and tools have been kind of collected together, that they should be able to be used on demand inside the Rivet environment. Um, there's kind of the people that make Hyper, they have this kind of like uh, story that they tell themselves about uh, stadium seating in football stadiums. Now, there's probably like millions of football stadiums around the world. And every single time a football stadium is designed, someone has to work out how high, how steep the, the seating should be so that the person behind has a person has a view of the pitch over the head of the person in front. And and this kind of calculation, this stadium ball calculation is like has to be worked out every single time because the, the shape of the stadium is always different. So they suggested that kind of like sometimes like the computers used to work this out using a uh, grasshopper or something like that. And what they want to achieve as a company, Hyper, is to create a situation where everyone is working on the same script for that um, that problem. So that instead of having a messy situation where individuals are all by themselves working on on different scripts and some might have good features and some have even better features and then like it all being kind of messy. They, they want to bring together all the algorithms in one place and kind of like give access to them to everyone in the in in the world who's working on those problems. Um, so I guess it's kind of like my long term prediction is it'll continue to be messy for quite a while, but over time people are going to try and like streamline access to these tools so that um people can, can make better use standardize it i guess and regulate it yeah yeah just so that it's like not messy and open but kind of like structured and usable so that a great number of people can can make use of these these tools really so then brilliant well that's all my um questions just want to say okay. thank you so much um that was brilliant uh, presentation, really informative.